All right, everybody, welcome back. Welcome back to the Dips to Rips podcast with the legend Howard Greenberg and myself. I am Charles Moon, the disciple of trend. And today we are going to talk about a few topics, but uh, I just want to say go Celtics. That's right, baby. Go Celtics. <laughs> that's, got our listen, game that's Howard. I, I like Golden State. I actually hey, said hey, Golden hey, State hey, was hey. gonna win. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Just because I'm a I'm a I'm a Curry fanboy because there's yeah, no one like him. I, I do like he's best shooter of all time. I mean. But I, I gotta say my uh favorite NBA player right now is Jason Tatum. What a beast. What's he gonna drop tonight? 29, 7, and 8. That's what I say. Nice. That would be over all of the uh the DraftKings stuff that I was looking at earlier today. <laughs> Play those overs, man. You get those points. <laughs> uh, you know, the problem, as you know, with that, with actually with that stuff is that they're all like, it is all the crazy um, juice they charge on all the bets. They're all like minus 120s and stuff. So you're like, come on. First of all, you, you already got it. Like, yeah, it's 24. I want to say it was 24 and a half, 20, either 24 and a half or might have been 26 and a half at Tatum. 26 and a half Tatum points minus 120. The, the, the reason why they could get away with these, these it's all made up stuff. <laughs> they it is it up. made up, but in the same sense, it's also, um, you know, a lot of the Vegas bookies and casinos don't get that type of action. Um, right. Well, they're now all doing it though. They no, are they're trying or they're trying. They're trying. Yeah, they're, I mean, they're, they're, yeah, they're playing a little bit smarter because I've noticed here in DC, um, you know, MGM opened up a, a, a full service sports book that, you know, you can do up to the minute gambling right at the Nat Stadium. Um, so you're right there watching the baseball game, you know, posted betting, the Barstool pitch. sports book. At the yeah. place I was at in Colorado out here. Yeah. Yeah. So that <laughs> stuff. Yeah. So they're all in it. They're all in it to win it. That's for sure. So let's start off. Like one of the things that we want to talk about with where the market is currently at right now is attractive names or what names like we should be looking at for the longer term picture, both in equities and with crypto. Now, on the equity side, for me, the most powerful companies in the world right now are tech companies. So it, it, it's it's no it's not rocket science, but you know, I'm probably more bullish on Apple and Microsoft than I would be on Amazon, but you really can't go wrong with any of them. You can't go wrong with NVIDIA, which is, you know, pretty much the most dominant GPU process processor slash component maker. Um, now, do you worry about Taiwan with that? So I, you know, I, I don't. If you can start to hedge them, like, and say, you know, you know what, you know, I want to push you a little bit further. If, you know, I, I agree, they're all, you know, NVIDIA when it comes to semiconductors is number one, right? right or right. the best chip chip company. But is a chip company a better spot than Amazon right now, in your opinion? So, you know, e so a break a breakdown for me is because of the health of the company, where Amazon yeah. fundamentally is actually getting lower than Wall Street projections, which is incredible right now. And you know, a company like Amazon would be more affected under the current market environment as opposed to say someone like Nvidia, who reported you know glowing numbers. And more importantly, they have a lot of growth vehicles, especially in something that's called like deep learning or AI. And this is really important because this is where a lot of companies are pivoting. When we talk about VC money, VC money is coming into crypto, but in the tech world, Howard, it's coming into like deep tech. That's what's really centered towards. So it's like data dissemination, data collecting, algorithmic data compilation, uh, self self-serving systems. Um, in terms of, you know, AI it, and machine learning, AI, and right. It, it, to, to a degree of what Palantir is doing, but pretty much on a scale that's much, 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 much greater. Um, I'm, I, it's not that I am a tech nerd. I just so happen to have a friend that's married to a tech nerd, uh, a guy that's involved in startups, you know, his, one of his best friends is a higher up in Microsoft, but in a division you would have never expected, which was really these acquisition divisions. And, you know, the, the portion of where Microsoft goes out hunting to buy all these companies are, is actually divided as well. That's the kind of capital that they're sitting on. And what Microsoft is trying to do is that they're them, you know, in competing with 
companies like Tesla, for example, or even especially Google, Google's probably the number one competitor in terms of acquisitions, is that they're yeah, out Google there searching. Bad, Google buys. Yeah, I mean, they're out there searching for the new tech that will cost them way more to try and develop and replicate as opposed to just buying the technology themselves. So, you know, it's, it's really interesting when we look in that forefront because that's where I see a lot of the future Just like when we talk about, you know, meta and Web3, a lot of that development is is probably going to be featured and and really helped. How how do I say this? Grown in a very short period of time through AI. And I and we don't think that's going to be a thing, but the whole purpose of Web3 was to try to make it free of these like tech corporations. And they're the ones that are trying to milk into it. We see retail companies like Adidas and Nike trying to pivot towards themselves as well. So it's an interesting development for me. I I believe that in terms of data consulting, you know, a lot of these like major corporate decisions is going to be a derivative from AI technology, it's not going to just be, you know, a risk management team or an analyst team that they have, that they're going to be much more reliant on this technology because it processes, it processes things quicker. It does it with a higher level of accuracy and it works on implementation. And, you know, what, what, when companies do pivot, it would be able to come at a much faster rate with a much smaller drawdown. So, you know, if I was to like look at it from five years down the road, do I want, do I think the exponential growth is in a name like Amazon or do I think that growth is in a name like AMD and NVIDIA? So that's my process in that. Like, I I really like semi companies a lot, but, you know, I like the standouts a little bit more like NVIDIA, AMD. You can even throw Micron in there. Qualcomm is important because they're so tied to, um, you know, cell phones and, and, you know, tablets and laptops. But at some point in time, we're going to see other companies try to develop their own tech and pivot away from them like Apple has. So it's really interesting. You know, you talk up a lot about future projects and what makes, you know, certain coins very attractive to you. This is kind of in that same sense, you know, where most people say GE and BA and Caterpillar and DE are the blue chips. But I think that because of the society we live in now, the blue chips are more like Apple and Microsoft and NVIDIA. And that's where that's where not only is it just a, you know, for me, a smarter bet, it's almost like it's a safer bet because this world is so dependent on technology now. So, you know, I guess in the same sense with you, Howard, what would be some of the names that you would have as a must have outside of obviously Bitcoin and Ethereum? Yeah, I mean, I'm looking at the teams that are actually producing right now. So, you know, you want to look and see things like Chainlink, where they've just launched on Solana. They just did a partnership, um, you know, after partnership with different outside entities to provide Oracle information that can be put into, like you said, data. They provide data. They provide the infrastructure for data to get blocked, put into blockchain. So they're building all the time. They have been well suited. Um, since, you know, the beginning of their creation um, to have a good foundation. Uh, And again, like you said, they invest in a lot of other companies as they come up, a lot of other projects. And by doing that, they lock in the fact that those, you know, other projects are going to use Chainlink as their Oracle. So, um, you know, pretty smart move by them. So Chainlink, definitely one right now that I like like that. Um, you know, Algorand's really been beaten up when it comes to like a dip to rip down the down the road here. And the bottom line is, you know, Algorand's got some pretty good backers behind it besides the VC money, which, you know, some people would say is actually a negative right now um, in the marketplace. What I'll point out is that they are highly um, connected with Deloitte and in the adoption of enterprise solutions for blockchain. So wow. you know, another thing that, that I think you're going to see a lot more that, and you're seeing a lot more things get built out that are, you know, um, using blockchain technology for financial solutions or in financial processes that you don't really think about today, like using NFTs for fractionalized ownership of real estate, looking at using fractionalized ownership of solar renewable energy projects through the use of 
um, NFTs. Uh, or uh, Ocean Protocol um, is using NFTs to, to give the uh, rights to data and data sets um, to people. So again, like you said, data is definitely going to be the future. It already is and made the biggest companies in Web2. Um, those that figure out how to democratize that data, but also make it accessible um, to everybody are going to be the big winners um, also. When yeah, it comes it's so to important these days, market, right? Everything's data. Um, yeah. So for that, I've been really interested. DAG, which is Constellation, one of my sort of under the radar, not a top 100 project that I really like. They have partnerships and contracts with the Department of Energy, Department of Defense and the U.S. Air Force. They do a lot with uh, hypergraphs. They have created a um, system where they're going to democratize data also, again, where they have these devices that are called DOR, D-O-R, and they are heat uh, sensors that you put over retail stores and they can judge um, you know, rates of entry, how long people are in there, and they're using body heat to do this. No cameras, no data security, no identity um, of anybody. So no invasion of privacy, which is what no everybody is worried about. No invasion of privacy at all. So really taking that sort of ESG approach, um, but also be still being able to use that data. And for again, for those stores, for anybody that puts one of these units up, the data that you're, you're, you're collecting is actually going to be able to be monetized by people. So, you know, whether it be, you know, and they were going through all the different types of entities that actually buy data that you really wouldn't think like governments, you know, who need to know by zip code, certain information <laughs> again for emergency response. Um, you know, they want to have a certain amount of firemen per, you know, the, the, the usage in a mall or something. Yeah. 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 Um, you know, there are some serious, like, you know, things that you could really do with it. And that's what you're going to see. You're going to see these data exchanges. So getting a little bit off the beaten path of some of the ones I really like, but you know, that's, those are a couple, you know, we have a lot of things going through some fundamental upgrades right now. You already know Ethereum is about to go through the merge. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, and we saw today they actually kicked off on Ropston, uh, the test net. That's pretty big. Cardano is about to do its Vasile upgrade, which is going to be the first sort of component to their scaling and scalability solutions. Um, so that's starting to get some fundamental things, some fundamental changes there. Kava just went co-chain, so they now have an EVM chain and a Cosmos chain. Is so that why you were interested in it today? Yeah, yeah. It just didn't work out today's trade, looking at a short-term trade on it. Um, it didn't hold up. The MA didn't hold up, so we dumped out of it before it was too big of a loss. Uh, I um, but yeah, yeah, that's why I've been up on Kava. Um, you know, you know That's the right attitude, Howard, because I've done that too. I, I dumped coin the other day. I, I uh, it it actually was like right at break even, and then it started to lift against me, and I said, "Screw this, man! I'm done with it." And so I basically dumped it for about a dollar eighty loss per share, and it's still like it, it it would technically still be against me right now. It hasn't broken out, but I you know I like this attitude, and I like I really like the decisive decision because. We, we make these decisions as traders based on a process of, of information. And if all of a sudden the information that we're counting on, right, the data points or the price levels that we're looking at to be a reference, to give us that conviction to be a buy, all of us start failing against us. Well, we have another choice as a trader. Do we, do we realize the full loss or do we scramble out and maintain, you know, whatever capital that we have? and not lose anymore. And, you know, again, these are, for me, are always important decisions as a trader because not every trade will work out. You and I, you know that, I know that, we've experienced that. And right. what's really going to keep us in the game really a long time is by making these quick decisions and not being married to one side and listening to the market as opposed to just hoping and praying, right? So, yeah, yeah. kudos to you, yeah, brother. Absolutely. Well, and, in, you know, right now we've got between the macro situations out there, you know, in crypto being 24-7, you got to be a little careful, more careful right now. 
Um, and quite honestly, Bitcoin just looks like it's tiring out even at this lower level, 30,200. You know, I was hoping it was going to go up to 31.5. It went up to 31.5. It would have taken me, you know, it would have taken Kava up on its wings to where I needed it to go. True. Um, true. And that's the thing is, you know, Bitcoin's price movements haven't been as big as the alts recently, but they've definitely still given you the direction. So, you know, you got to watch and see which way Bitcoin is going to turn. Um, because everything's sort of moving with it. It's just a matter of the alts, finding the right alts, like I did with Cardano the other day. Yeah. That's going to move at a little bit more of a faster rate because, again, they just had a lot of news going on. You know, you got you to follow the sentiment. You got to see when the PR firms are in full effect and pumping, you know, whether it's the VC that's putting that out or the foundations, I don't know. Um, but it's, you know, it's not a coincidence that all of a sudden, 13 or 14 different news aggregators put articles out about Cardano within a day or two. Um, you know, the, the PR firms are pumping that stuff out. So, take so you know, you know, Howard, when you and I first met, we really didn't talk much, you know, we were just briefly introduced, but the one like, and, and, you know, Howard's from, you know, a totally different area than myself, Mike and Scott, you know, where we could just like, you know, walk down the street or technically drive down the street, okay? drive <laughs> down the street to go and hang out. If we wish, we, it, you know, if we want to hang out with Howard, we have to get on a flight for a couple hours and, you know, go say what's up. And if you can't tell, look at his t-shirt where my man is from, but in the same sense, even without knowing Howard's credentials, the moment that Howard brought up this one chart and he was tracking the volume he mentioned the volume in, several times here and he's done it in a lot of different podcasts and i want to explain why that's so important to our listeners because th this is something that has been a part of trading since it was created right the, the ticker tape howard you look at it slightly different because your chart looks at it different right but you know i'm, I'm more old school where i'm looking at it through time and sales but what Howard does is look at anomalies of volume and recognizes what the market is trying to do and capitalizes it. And respectfully, in the quote unquote trading universe, and it doesn't matter whether it's equities, it's options, it's crypto or any other asset, Forex, it doesn't matter. Volume is always king. They're always telling us a story because we could fake and spoof bids and offers, right? We could we could uh, give the illusion of the uh of the you know books looking healthy and all of a sudden bids get pulled and the, and the orders get slammed and we see that crash and it, and we're not just talking about crypto this happens in equities all the time as well you know spoofing is a thing they actually had to make it illegal but the one thing that not really illegal, made me though. yeah the one thing that i really <laughs> knew that that the second i saw it and how we started talking about and how legit he was in terms of being a true trader and it's no disrespect, like I said, I just met Howard, was when he started pulling out the tape and started talking about it. And I knew right away, I knew right away at that moment, Howard, that I was going to love you forever, my man. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, so, Charlie. You know, it's funny that Howard talks about, you know, the points of data. And, you know, what's even crazier is that now all of a sudden it's one of the biggest industries out there, right? Buying and selling data. That's one of the big things out there. You know, and that leads me to something like Citadel, the news on Citadel from, well, let's say the news from the SEC, right? Uh, how Citadel keeps Robin Hood in business is that they buy their order flow. They basically says, I want to know what your market is going to be at every price for every single stock. And uh, in turn, I'm just going to give you a little bit of this and a little bit of that, depending on what we decide to pick and choose, et cetera. Right. And so today uh, the SEC. So first of all, can I ask a question, Charlie? What do they sure. do with that data? So it, are they front trading on that? Can they front trade that? In some respect, they are the ones that are creating the market for that data, right? That's why they want it, is to be able to fulfill that market. Question is, who are they fulfilling that market for, right? Whether it's their arm or maybe a buddy buddy or maybe it's Goldman Sachs or whoever it is. But in respect, when you kind of look, and it, this is this is on Reddit, and I, there, there's like backers or people that are tied with Citadel that are doing this exact same thing that in turn also decides to either pump this into the exchanges or directly to other brokers as well. And it just becomes this big cesspool of liquidity that, that they're kind of picking and choosing from in microseconds. And within those microseconds, there's like 
change that kind of falls out, but that change really is like in dollar bills. And part of that is how they make money. Part of that is absolutely correct. Do they front run it? They claim they don't because it would be illegal for them to, but respectfully, they could put in that order before that market participant gets filled. And then when they recognize people are trying to exit, they could get their orders in to exit before those market participants get filled. And that's where the issue is, is that Citadel and all these other HFT firms have that ability to slide it in before market participants and get the heck out out quicker than market participants. And because of the volume, not only in terms of actual equity size, but the amount of trades that they do, they don't need more than a few pennies here and there. And it's not even a few pennies. I mean, I've read a little bit of micro pennies. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's like, all they need. Because you so you many transactions. If they're clearing every transaction for Robinhood, I mean, I don't know Robinhood's volume offhand at all. I would just be guessing at something. Um, but you know, whatever that is, if you take the amount of trades a day that Robinhood does, and you take one tenth of a penny, that adds up pretty significantly. Especially oh yeah. No lose. Oh you know yeah. What I mean? You know, and that's but that's been like, you know, always what I've always heard on Reddit and I experienced I, I used Robin Hood um, and still use it for uh, options is that, you know, the claim was always you always got your bid. You know, that's why, I, you know, anyways, you should be using market limit orders and, you know, for <laughs> right, buys and sells right. anyways. But people that are stupid enough to do market orders, which are just scam anyways, um, are always losing a penny here or a penny there. Um, and then when, Flippage. you know. Yeah, the slippage. Exactly. And that's where they make their money. So, yeah. So, I mean, interesting because now they're coming uh, are talking about coming into the world of crypto. They uh, partnered with or got some money from Paradigm and Sequoia, and they are partnering with Virtue, which is another market maker um, to make. They want to be create a crypto ecosystem, trading ecosystem. So they say not even an exchange. And it's something I've talked about. I'm not sure if I talked about it on this podcast, but in the room, I talk about it all the time and have done some videos. As I said that once I heard um, the CFTC commissioner talk a couple of months back, and now it's probably six months back, um, about what he saw as the vision for crypto um, being regulated by the CFTC, yeah. to me, it really made me think that there was going to be some sort of central order book. That's going to come because right now, as you know, every exchange operates independently of themselves and exactly. they quite honestly use internal ledgers. They don't even use the blockchain to record orders. Dude, that's um, see that and, that's where that's where it's a little effed up, to say the least. You know? Absolutely. And FTX, of course, have been accused of front running and Binance front running because they are yeah. not 100 percent illegal. So that's what scares me. Now you're going to give Citadel this kind of info yeah, and, where and, maybe uh, they're Vir- not regulated. And Howard, uh, I, you know, I don't know if you knew this about Virtu, and I don't know if the streak is still alive, but what they're actually best known for was being on an incredible winning streak where they literally don't lose on a daily basis. That's actually what they're known for. They're a publicly traded company, VIRT. And, you know, they dipped on that news. But think about a company like that working hand in hand with a company like Citadel, which on the back end is probably going to work with companies like Renaissance Technology or Bridgewater, or they're going to muscle in on this move. And then you start involving companies like FTX and Binance. Now you mentioned Binance. Uh, what was the news today? They're getting sued for what? Well, they're not getting sued. They're, are they getting, getting investigated on the sorry? SEC um, for a variety of things in regards to their ICO. Um, whether it was their, you know, money laundering charges are being accused along with some other things. Um, but it's still that's very common much in retail, the inquiry. right? Yeah. I've, I heard, mean, I've heard that before about exchanges having their own crypto being like a way for them to wash money, so to speak. So, well, so- yeah, I mean, I think it's more the problem is, is that Binance.com, and again, it's not Binance.us, although they are loosely associated. Um, Some say not loosely enough, and that's what part of this inquiry is. (laughs) Um, But, you know, Binance.com back in the day before, you know, they decided to listen to the SEC or realize that they could get in trouble, were pretty lax with the rules. And as an American investor, um, they didn't really ask you for KYC. They didn't ask you for any AML information. 
And it's where a lot of, um, you know, the different cash outs of hack, hacks and even money linked to the Lazarus Group, which is North Korean based, um, have been said to have been cashed out through Binance. So, so there are some serious accusations. Um, they've come out and disputed them. So we'll see, because, again, a lot of this stuff is, you know, you know, the SEC, and in this case, it's, I believe it's Chain Analysis who gave the information to the SEC, you know, who is their contractor that works on this stuff, usually has a pretty good mapping of all the wallets involved and will show where that connection are. So it will really be up to Binance, you know, and, and Binance is unfortunately up until probably six months ago, their sort of view was we're going to do what we want and then come make us do it differently. And then, yeah, we, I was you know, going to say like, how is the SEC a very good way of doing it for Binance? So, um, but like, know, how did this come about Howard? Do you think it's a whistleblower? Like who, like why is, did the SEC get an audit ask or ask for information to audit? And um, they got it? No, no. I mean, my personal opinion, and this is sort of more conspiracy theory. So this is only, this oh. is my personal, hey, opinion. this is my, what makes it juicy. My man. personal opinion only is the SEC realizes they're about to lose their case with Ripple. Everything has gone the wrong way for them in oh. their, their case with XRP. One of the ways that they were going to send the shot across the bow of crypto was at the time that they went after Ripple, Ripple was a top five sized you know, project, right? Right. Um, I believe that Ripple is going to win its case or at least win the majority of the case. They might get a small slap on the wrist or something. Sure. Um, so now Mr. Gensler needs to, you know, find his next target and Binance is a juicy target because they've definitely done some things on the borderline. Remember, they were the ones that were, especially when they went after Coinbase, when Coinbase went public, they were offering a tokenized version of their stock right. um, on Binance.com, not here in the U.S., but overseas. And that goes against the rules of the SEC. And, you know, it's pretty well known that they were going to get their selves in trouble and immediately from that that's really when that was really the the last straw that was when the uk got mad at binance that's when hong kong got mad at binance they also hey, oh i remember that you cannot make just stocks out of you know thin right. air it right. doesn't right. 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 Uh, Very, not, yeah. not, not a not a thing so um so in my opinion you know that's what that that's what i think it is i think that this was the next best one to go after um trying to save know, face yeah, basically yeah they want they want a big win they want that big win they've really not had a you know they we haven't had a huge case go to trial um there's been some settlements of things like block five you know where they settle without admitting wrongdoing and move on from there and you know get under the auspices of it you know the other part is it's and i still think we're about a year away but as the new um, Financial Innovation Act that was just proposed by Loomis and Gillibrand and the Senate um, moves through and hopefully gets to resolution and made into an actual bill. Um, you know, it's going to lay out a regulatory framework that will clear up a lot of this stuff so that in the future we'll have, you know, what's tough is they're going back and they're saying to people, you should have done more due diligence or you should have known but there wasn't any, you know, you're asking people to put stuff into rules and codes that were written in, you know, World War II. Um, you're right. And it's not you know, updated with what's going on now. And not, you know, listen. Right. That, and, there, and when you get out of jurisdictions and a lot of these things, they weren't U.S. companies, you know. So in their opinion, they felt they were OK. But, you know, as we find out and we know, U.S. has long arms and if you do include U.S. citizens and what you do somehow or allow them, and I would say Binance is going to try to say that they didn't prohibit, but they didn't promote, um, if you know what I mean, is, you know, like the same thing that I said with Ripples. I can tell you that there were U.S. citizens that definitely bought Ripples ICO. Their ICO was probably a security at the time. That probably is a violation and there probably needs to be a fine that's paid. Ripple has a very big foundation, huge treasury, lots of money. They'll pay the fine and move on. Um, you know, I'm surprised there hasn't been a finance. settlement. That that well, seems- Ripple to this point has said no. Ripple has said we are going. I know, I know, they're the ones staying strong. Yeah, right? they're saying they do. I think that at this point, Gensler would have jumped out a little while ago if he could have. 
Um, but I think Ripple is going to take this all the way because it, you know, it does, it's stuff that isn't fair. You know, they, you know, quite honestly, they've usually gone after small projects that weren't well-founded enough, funded right. enough to protect themselves. And, you know, as I said yesterday in a, in a couple of tweets and other things, because I appreciate what this bill that's coming tries to do because it tries to regulate through education and codification, not educate through enforcement. All right. um, and that has been how they've treated crypto to this point. So, yeah, so uh, Charlie, yeah. So let's get back to you for a second here, buddy. So I want to know. So so what are we thinking? Is Tesla? Is it a buy at this price? So what do you think? It sounds like you're big on the Kathy Woods sort of arc innovative things have they hit their bottom or are you waiting uh, okay. still so or, some I mean, of bottom because nobody buys the bottom like we some, some of the arc items yes i'm actually not a fan of kathy woods um okay. i think i think her arc fund has been proven that they're only a byproduct of market conditions right. when it's absolutely at its maximum peak value but in the same sense that's optimal for everybody that's involved in the markets, their insistency and the stubbornness is what's most alarming. Crazy, the fact huh? that I know that there are big believers of genomic technology, right there, there are, she's obviously believes in TDOC. I hate to say it, but Teladoc is only used in some healthcare systems and a lot of healthcare systems have actually pivoted to Zoom because it's actually cheaper for them and a lot more common to be used with their patients. It's, it's, it's more of a brand recognition. So I don't understand the guidelines. You know, the only thing that I could see where Teladoc has any potential to get back to where it was before is if the United States pivots and is like, you know what, Zoom is now on the blacklist. We've found spyware or whatever. You know, we think that it's being used for, you know, um, various acts. Yeah, you know, it's, it's it's the same thing. Like how how you know the U.S. was all paranoid about the drone companies that were coming out of China. So, you know, this is something that that for me that I think Arc has failed greatly at was that they as automated as AI based that they were uh, still succumbed to human emotion in believing that they were right and not recognizing the markets for what they were. And now they're, they're reacting too late. So would I buy some of these names that they happen to love? It, it depends. Um, am I a believer of Tesla? I am. I absolutely, it's like, you know, this is something I did want to talk about today that I didn't really mention, but I think we could talk about it now. I am a fan of Tesla because I believe a, it's a foundation that's going to be self-sustaining and long sustaining, very similar to a network like Apple had built out where their fan base, their clientele base is pretty fanatical. Um, I also think that they're going to work on the actual scope of the quality. The, the, the technology itself is obviously, you know, phenomenal, but the, the quality of the build is still left to be desired. And I think with the new Gigafactory opening up in Austin, that's going to be really important. It, you know, t as Tesla is still very expensive relative to who and what they are. Yes, but I also believe that they're well deserving of this valuation. If they pull back to the 400, 500, 600 level, it's always worth looking into and starting to nibble at because in the long run, you know, whether they split again or not, they're still going to make this like furious, volatile demand and runs. And, and at any point in time, you can obviously cash out. I love Elon Musk. I really do. I really love what he's trying to do. I think he's reckless in a sense, but I don't think he realizes he is because he doesn't realize the power that he has. I think he's starting to recognize it now. And more importantly, not as he's not only is he starting to recognize it, he's really starting to take advantage of it. And so he's going to be able to leverage this power position into Tesla. The one thing that I would be scared of as a Tesla shareholder is the aforementioned SCC, who I'll talk about in a bit why I am furious with them here right now. Um, if, if they get to this point where they're just like, Elon is either too powerful or causing too much madness, 
they can make it a point or they could make it an incredible headache where they could ban uh, Elon um, from from being executive. And, right. and he could only be a uh, um, on the board, and like and, and stuff like that would totally, obviously, screw up Tesla in so many different ways. But I don't think we'll ever be able to get to that point. Um, the worst case scenario for the SEC is that 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 their their ruling, which it's not going to happen, but their ruling on the four twenty issue or going private issue and the going private tweet uh, gets overturned against them. Now, again, that's never going to happen in my opinion, but, um, and I think they just actually had a court case on it where a judge ruled in their favor as well. But if they can't, you know, reign in Elon, they're going to keep trying to apply pressure on him. And in that sense, I believe that Elon is going to turn face and really throw it in the face of the establishment and that makes me like him more than, and it's, it's not that I'm anti-establishment, but I like that he's going against the gun. I like that he's smart enough. Uh, he's clearly smart enough to understand the situation at hand. He understand what he wants to do with Twitter. He's not really buying it to make money. He's doing it to give the people the freedom of speech, whether we like it or not. And he knows that Twitter is, you know, saturated with these bots. You know, the entire whole social media field is right. We talked about the controversy of uh, Russian hackers influencing the election and whatnot. So, you know, for me, every venture that Elon goes forward with is going to make a tremendous amount of money. And in turn, when you're a golden child like that, whether it's retail or it's Wall Street or whoever, they're going to back you. They're going to be with you. And, you know, he, he mentioned Starlink won't be uh, up for IPO for a few years and SpaceX as well. What do you think SpaceX's valuation is going to be once it goes public? It's going to be stratospheric. It's got to be. It's going to be one of the biggest IPOs. And it may not be because it's SpaceX. It may be purely because it's Elon Musk bringing that online. So the, the long answer is worry about there is that that's where his fighting with like the president can be a problem. You know, NASA, he had, they have a lot of NASA contracts. They do. Um, and those, those could be a risk. My worry with Elon is that how does somebody run so many different companies? Well, um, and I, you know, it's not like some other ones that I've seen, like, you know, cause Berkshire Hathaway is a great example, but at Berkshire Hathaway, They've left, you know, or had really strong people. So they buy Allegheny, but the Allegheny CEO stays on in a role under, you know, Berkshire. Um, you know, so they're able they have a team in place. You don't really ever hear of Elon's team. And in fact, from what I've heard, you know, a lot of those people left, right, to go start Fisker and some of these other companies. Yeah. Well, so, the, the engineers you know, so, so those yeah. are the, that, so that that is the only, you know, and again, I don't nearly know as much about his companies as you do. Um, but it's the one thing that always worries me is that when they get just, you know, the, you, I want to see, you know, if I'm going to put a big part of my earnings and my investment into something like Tesla, then I want it to be like the passion. And I do think it is the passion, but what is his passion? Is space X is passion is Tesla is passion is free speech is passion is being a superstar is passion. You know, what is his passion? Um, and how is that evolving? Because I agree that he's one of the smartest men of our generation, but you know, it's, there aren't many Michelangelo's or Thomas Edison's. No, you're, you're right. And Howard, you know what? He's, he's smart enough that he's actually started delegating more. Um, He brought a point man, someone who he trusted greatly from Tesla to basically come over and run SpaceX. And when he says he doesn't sleep, you know, there's been, there's been documentaries of him, you know, where, where filmmakers have tracked him and he really doesn't sleep. He's really on top of Tesla on SpaceX and even boring. And it, it's overwhelming. I don't know how long he could last. I don't know how long he could continue with this, but in all respect, it's, it's, he's making it happen now. And right. I, and it's true. Once he, once these companies get bigger, 
he's going to have to delegate more. And it, it's really going to come down to who he trusts out of his team. So, you know, that's going to be important because once we talk about other people's money gets involved, right? I mean, private money is private money, of course, but when it comes to private money, there's a lot more flexibility than when it becomes public money. That's very different. So, you know, I, I am a person who believes in Elon. I'm sure he's going to have failures. He's mentioned his failures, but you know, if SpaceX IPOs, you know, and it, and it dips, it's like, you got to buy it because Elon, right. And, you know, you mentioned about his back talk to the president, no disrespect. I highly doubt that Joe Biden at his age is going to run for a second term. He may try, but I don't know if the retail American public appreciates gas prices, inflation, plus his age. I really think that it's going to be a big concern. There's already rumblings in the uh, DNC that that they may not want to renominate him. Crazy, because it's none of this is Biden's fault, by the way, respectfully. It really isn't. Um, it's just kind of the, he was just a victim of circumstance. He took on a situation and was faced with immediate problems that have only exploded to like atmospheric portions and we're not stopping. Like crude's still going to be running here. You know, and people are calling for 150, you know, no wonder Elon's going to be successful. Who the hell wants to pay, you know, $150 for gas every time. And, and they're probably paying $150 for the Toyota Camry. We're not talking about luxury vehicle for the Toyota Camry. So, yeah, I mean, long Tesla. <laughs> there you go. You know, it, it's one of those things that I probably wouldn't want to buy it high just because taking on that kind of heat will be uh, pretty heavy when Tesla does have negative news. But, you know, it's one of those, you know, never fade the musk is what we say here um, in the uh -huh. equities program. Never uh -huh. fade the musk. Buy those dips. You know, um, Howard, we don't have too much time left, so I just want to say if Boston takes game two, holy crap. Game three, three. Wait, what, what game are we on? Game, game three. three? One, one. Oh, man. I've been on vacation too long. Wait, this yep. is back at home, right? Yep. We're in Boston tonight. Okay, man. so they win. What's the schedule like? Do you guys have three at home and then two we back there? Two. two. So it's two, one, one, one. So we have tonight, we have Friday night at home, okay. Sunday back in San Fran, Tuesday back in Boston, uh, and if needed, Thursday back in uh, Golden State. Celtics can six, baby. Celtics. Said, if needed. You know, for me, I, I, I usually tune out, with the exception of the Super Bowl, I usually tune out all playoffs if my team gets out of it. Or if my team sucks in the season, I don't give up on the season. I watch, you know, predominantly because I'm in fantasy. So I'm always paying attention, by the way, fantasy champ here. Um, but when it gets to the playoffs, I really don't care. Like I, I, right. You know what I'm doing right now during the NBA playoffs is I'm taking. Wait, you didn't win our fantasy league. No, 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 not, I'm not, oh, okay. I didn't say football. Oh, okay. I was like, wait a second. <laughs> but trust me, I've been, I've been, you can, you can check my credentials. I'll show you, I'll show you my trophies, but um, what, what I'm doing right now is actually pretty interesting. It's something called moment ranks, which is owned by Dapper and they hold these, I, I guess you create a fantasy lineup, um, with you, with the NFTs that you own through top shots. And it's a day, it's a, it's a, well, it, during the season, it's a daily prize. And then obviously it's in the playoffs. There's usually like 3000 people that do it, Howard. And first place walks away 500 bucks, no entry fee. It's a free roll. And so that's all I pay oh, attention to yeah. in the playoffs. Yeah. yeah it's cool. It's almost like Matt and Mutt. Like they're the, you know, you make your own teams. Well, you can. It, it, do you ever do DFS daily? No, nah, I don't. Okay. I don't. So I, I, I've done it here and there. I've, I've, but that's really what you're doing. And with the NFTs, the twist is not just picking the players, but picking the right moment. So whether it's assist moment, a block moment, a steal moment, um, uh, a, a points moment. And when you hit above their 10 day average, you get a bonus. It's kind of degen, but it also keeps you really involved. And it's really cool. And again, if, you know, for someone like you, who's really involved in your sports, I'm involved in, more fantasy again, but 
Um, it may be something that you may want to look into, Howard. I know no, you're not a big my fan whole thing of is that I, I'm a fan, so I have issues with fantasy. I do our league at Prosper, and that's pretty much it because I once was rooting for LaShawn Green to score no. a touchdown against the Patriots no. for the Jets, and I said, that's it. I'm out, I'm out no. of this. No, um, I, I was with you. I, my wife always tells the story that um, – because I built out her fantasy team for work and she had Aaron Rodgers and it was playing the bears and she cheered when he hit a 40 yard bomb. And I said, absolutely not. Absolutely not. <laughs> you take that somewhere else. Absolutely not. Go bears. Yeah, so that was it. So I decided that's it. I'm out. I'm out. <laughs> I'm a very low, low, low value fantasy player. I'll bet on games, you know? And like you said, I like the parlays. I do like the fact now that you can throw, you know, the problem is that's how they get you. You bet $5 on <laughs> 10 terrible, and they all ring around one game that that game always loses. You know what I mean? <laughs> Let's uh, just say we're both homers. Yeah, absolutely. W- when we bet, we're very biased in what we want. Oh, yeah. I, I only bet. I like, I will bet if there's a, like, if this, if the Celtics were a big enough favorite tonight, like plus, you know, 180 plus 200, then I'll take the other side for like $50. So that I'm so that if the Celtics win, I'm excited. I'm not happy. I don't care. I lost 50 bucks. And if Bring they it. lose, at least I win. Too you paid hard. 50 for that Celtics. Win. Yeah, so, so that's yeah. So that's my my view. All right, guys and gals, just want to say we're going to wrap things up here. But if you happen to have liked this podcast, if you happen to love what Howard or, I, or myself had said, do me a favor, comment down below if you're on that YouTube page. But more importantly, we really want you folks to share this with your friends and family if you feel that it's informative. Howard and I are always trying to stay on top of the news, give our opinions, thoughts. And, you know, part of it is is just keeping people up to date just in case they're not familiar or, or they just don't know the full story. Even myself, you know, I always learn something from Howard from these podcasts and or we try to also try to coach, educate people, make people more informed, because if you are an informed trader, you are dangerous. And more importantly, you are ahead of the rest of the market and it puts you in a better position as a trader, as an investor. Again, this is not financial advice. This is just something that we, you know, see we like to give our opinions on. Um, we'll never always be 100% correct, but this is our platform. So we can say whatever the hell we want. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, just want to say, okay, have a good night, people. everybody. Peace and Talk love. Soon. This has been dips to rips with Howard Greenberg and Charlie moon brought to you by prosper trading Academy. Visit us at prospertrading.com to find out more. This podcast should not be considered professional financial and or investment advice. By accessing this podcast, you acknowledge that Prosper Trading Academy, LLC, PTA, makes no warranty, guarantee, or representation as to the accuracy or sufficiency of the information featured in this podcast. The information and opinions presented in this podcast are for general information only, and any reliance on the information provided in this podcast is done at your own risk. PTA does not endorse, approve, recommend, or certify any information, product, process, service, or organization presented or mentioned in this podcast, and information from this podcast should not be referenced in any way to imply such approval or endorsement. The third-party materials or content of any third-party site referenced in this podcast do not necessarily reflect the opinion, standards, or policies of the PTA. PTA assumes no responsibility or liability for the accuracy or completeness of the content contained in third-party materials of the third-party sites referenced in this podcast or the compliance with applicable laws of such materials and or links referenced herein. Moreover, PTA makes no warranty that this podcast or server that it makes it available is free of viruses, worms, or other elements of codes that manifest contaminating or destructive properties. PTA expressly disclaims any and all liability or responsibility for any direct, indirect, incidental, special, consequential, or other damages arising out of any individual's use of, reference to, reliance on, or inability to use this podcast or the information presented in this podcast.